Okay, welcome back. So thank you for joining us for this late afternoon session. We were just lamenting that it's usually kind of sleepy time. So hopefully you had a chance to grab a <laughs> snack and some caffeine, and hopefully we keep the conversation lively enough to keep you up. Um, this panel is called Cloudy with a Chance of Legislation, um, aptly, given the weather today. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what legislation might look like in the U.S., um, toss around some ideas. As you know, um, when it comes to digital privacy, there are meaningful steps that either have been taken, uh, as you heard during the last panel, um, or at a planned stage at nearly every level of government. Um, so many states are mulling op uh, options, as we know. We saw what happened in California with the CCPA um, passing its own law. At the federal level, we have the NCIA reviewing comments they've received on the path forward. And NIST is in the process of developing its own privacy framework, um, while a number of congressional offices, as, I've, as I'm sure you've seen, have released drafts of bill, uh, bills that they hope to focus on in this legislation of Congress. Um, and then you have the tech industry, which is operating on all kinds of different business models, which can create a bit of a problem in terms of how we sort of work this. Um, so in this panel, we're going to try and tackle uh, what we're actually trying to solve for, what kind of framework might best apply um, to what those needs are, um, who should enforce any kind of framework that we do come up with, and then how that might interplay with the rest of the world. Um, as we know, Europe is operating under the GDPR, which is um, a bit ahead of us. So how do we sort of catch up and how we, might we interplay? Um, we have quite a few speakers today and we have a lot to talk about. So I'm going to do sort of brief intros and you can do some Googling if you want to know more. Um, I am Angelique Carson. I'm the editor of the Privacy Advisor via the, I, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, the IAPP, and I'm the host of the Privacy Advisor podcast. Um, to my right, we have Maureen Olhausen, who's a partner at Baker Botts and chair of its antitrust and competition law group. Next to her is Chris Calabrese, vice president for policy at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Next to him is Jason Albert, who's Deputy General Counsel at Workday. Uh, next to Jason is Elizabeth Banker, who is Vice President and Associate General Counsel at the Internet Associate Association? Associate. Association. Association, sorry. Um, and Terrell McSweeney, who is a partner at Covington. Um, so let's get started. Let's just first talk a little bit about what specific problem we're even trying to sort of solve for right now. Um, what types of business models regarding data collection, dissemination, and aggregation um, require regulation. Um, Chris, do you want to maybe start us off with that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I'm sure they'll get a, we'll get a lot of different perspectives on what the actual problem is. From our perspective, from CDT's perspective, the problem is that we've put too much burden on the individual to somehow try to solve this problem. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of analogies you can use. The one I like is that we don't expect people to walk into a building and check the, the fire codes or the make sure that the fire extinguishers all exist. We just assume that society has built that stuff in. Um, I think we need to start doing that for privacy and data. We need to start shifting responsibility from consumers to the institutions who collect the data, the institutions that use that data. Um, you know, I, I, would, I have to say this every single time I talk, so I'm sorry. CDT has draft privacy legislation, where we, which we have put together, where we'll try to embrace and actualize some of these ideas. So we're not just sort of pontificating on concepts, but we're really trying to put pen to paper. So I'm going to apologize, but I've been told in no uncertain terms I have to say that every time I talk. <laughs> but I think that's the problem. We need to end the check boxes, need to stop sort of giving a, a privacy policy checklist and putting more responsibility on companies and people who collect data. Applause, wow, nice. Um, Jason, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, are there data sets that are more sensitive than others that might require different treatment? There's not sort of a one box fits all. Uh, well, I think from our perspective, where I would start is by talking about how any privacy law that we should have, and we should have a privacy law, should be comprehensive in nature. So you could argue that certain types of data are more sensitive. There's sensitive data, obviously, under GDPR that's subject to some heightened protections. That might be part of a comprehensive law. But fundamentally, wherever companies interact with individuals' data, people should be confident that they have the same protections. And that should be true across business models. So for example, I work for an enterprise company. We have lots of personal data. It's our customers' data. They use it to you know, manage their workforces, uh, to, help, uh, to help their employees. We don't even have the right to see the data uh, in our contracts because our, our customers wouldn't want us to do that. But for us, we think privacy is essential because we want to make sure that we, companies can continue to innovate, to offer new services, to offer things like AI, 
in a world where there's increasing data and people will not let their data be used for those new technologies, for those new opportunities, if they lack confidence that it's protected. So it's important that we have sort of comprehensive protection, that it goes across data types, uh, again, perhaps with some, uh, some special rules for particularly sensitive categories. Maybe we can start with uh, Elizabeth on this next one. There's been a lot of focus, particularly among privacy advocates, that we need to do away with this model of notice and consent. Um, that, you know, I'm sure engineers will tell you that it's very difficult to create a product, and lawyers will tell you it's very difficult to communicate what that product does um, and how your data is being collected and used via that product to consumers in a concise way where they can make an informed decision. Um, I'm sure many of you have read Wardy Hartzog's work about this, where he has this phrase that I love that is our, our consent is preordained, that we're basically going to consent because the technology is manipulating us in that way. Um, Elizabeth, what do you think about doing away with this notice and consent regime that we've really been using in the U.S. for the last 20 years or so? Well, I think the um, what consumers really need, and this is partly to Chris's point, is they need consistent expectations. And I think the comprehensive framework that Jason's talking about would be part of establishing for consumers what is a consistent standard and what they can expect with regards to their privacy. I think another piece of that is also giving consumers controls over their data. So the ability to access, delete, correct, and to move their data from one provider to another, if that's their choice. I think it's also very important. But I, I do agree that notice and choice, I think NTIA, uh, GDPR, other models have recognized that notice and choice is, is a bit broken and that there may be spheres of activity where consumer choice can easily be inferred, uh, such as you know, if you are requesting a ride sharing card to appear and pick you up, you need to share your location. So what additional would notice and consent in that particular circumstances provide as long as the use is consistent with the user's expectations? I think it's where uses are not consistent with user expectations, that notice and choice becomes very important. Kind of an open question for the panel. Um, what do you think is the appropriate intersection of consumer responsibility and meaningful consent? Like, where is the consumer responsible and where is it on the, on the company? Um, so maybe, maybe I'll jump in yeah. uh, on that one. I think that there are certain areas where I, uh, consumers have generally similar preferences. And what we've seen is that where we have sectoral privacy um, regulation already, privacy laws already, are often in those areas. Financial information, medical information, the content of communications, information about children, right? So we've got those areas where I think we all sort of say, well, those are kind of, that's kind of sensitive data and we don't want that to be uh, shared freely. I think one of the challenges that we have moving forward, and I think Elizabeth uh, put her finger on it, the context is important, who has you know, the type of data, but who has it and what are they using it for? I don't want to be snowed under by, you know, do you consent to you know, the you know, LL Bean knowing your location to deliver the package that you just told them to deliver to you, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of a waste of time for everyone. So I think where consumers have a preference that's different than most people, then sort of what the context would be is where I think maybe there's the role for consumer uh, ability to express that mm -hmm. consent. Um, people have different preferences about, you know, some people like to share their information very widely, right? We've seen that in social media. I'm surprised sometimes what, what people feel is appropriate to put up uh, on a website. And, uh, but I don't want to necessarily be there saying you're not, you know, you're not permitted to. But if that is outside of what the, you know, the average person feels is, is norm, then the, that consumer maybe needs to uh, you know, opt in to that, to, to make that, that choice. But where we have a lot of knowledge already about where people have sensitivities, protect that a little more, and where people are less sensitive because in the context of the relationship. But one of the problems I think we need to talk about to get a little bit beyond this box of notice and consent, because so much we, we talk about these things are broken, so let's do more notice, more notice and consent, is actually talking a little bit more about what kinds of uses of data can actually harm consumers. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, what we're trying to get at is kind of controlling those things better 
uh, while still allowing the sort of day-to-day -day uses and not sort of, you know, coming up with a system that just numbs consumers by giving them, you know, over-consent, over-notice kinds can, of things. Can I say something vaguely controversial? Yeah, please. I think there are situations where the consumer shouldn't be able to consent. What? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think there are circumstances where information may be collected for one purpose, like precise geolocation in a mapping app, but the consumer shouldn't be able to click a checkbox that says, use this location information for other purposes. Because we as a society should decide that there are some uses that unless they are explicitly for the service that is offered, you should not be able to consent away that the collection of that information for some other purpose unless it is manifest in whatever your try application you're trying to use. So I think that's controversial, but I think it's something that we need to embrace. If we continue to say, oh, well, we have to give people the option to always consent. I think the result of that is we continue to have a checkbox where people are consenting away in ways that they don't understand and probably wouldn't be comfortable with if they did understand. I'm not saying that's true for everything, but I think we need to begin to grapple with real guardrails on what we're going to do with information, not just say, at the end of the day, you can wipe all these rules away as long as you have consent. Can I jump in on this? Please. I, I think it's a really interesting discussion, especially as a former FTC commissioner, where, of course, we were relying on a, on a notice and consent model for a really long time. I'm Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> we were on the commission together. And, uh, uh, and, and look, I think uh, Chris is right to a certain extent that one of the things the FTC, having recognized the shortcomings of the model that it was promoting for a very long time, was trying to do over the last decade or so is say, okay, but when we're talking about very sensitive information, some of the categories that Maureen has mentioned and geolocation like Chris has mentioned, we need to make sure that people have an additional interaction with how, how that information is going to be used. And it needs to be within the context of their interaction in a way that isn't just in those big terms of service that no one reads, right? So I think in, in an incremental way over time, the FTC, the, the federal kind of cop on the beat here, has been trying to move that direction. But to get back to your initial question about the problem that we're trying to solve, I think the problem we're trying to solve in the US act actively right now is a sense that there's been a real erosion of trust by people in technology because maybe this model wasn't keeping pace enough or maybe maybe it wasn't understood enough. And we need to come up with a consistent and coherent approach that is an American approach that we can articulate because right now, globally, we have a very fractured approach developing between GDPR and here in the United States, different state level approaches. But the, but the interesting thing I'd say about an American approach, and I agree with you about that, is that fundamentally, if you trace GDPR all the way back to the data protection mm -hmm. directive to the OECD privacy principles, it all derives from work that was done in the US. In 1973, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare came out with the Fair Information Practices principles because of concerns about how computerization and social security numbers were doing. And so, you know, from, from, from our perspective, we think that you can design a US law that's based on the OECD privacy principles that incorporates things like a purpose limitation, like a data minimization, like rights of access and correction, and all those things. And you can do that in a way that is consistent with the American legal system, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't mimic Europe, but the same way is interoperable. Because one thing that's true in a cloud-enabled world, data has to flow across borders. You know, we have to be able to, you know, manage, you know, workforces that span internationally. We have to manage customer bases that uh, that expand internationally. And it's important that any regime that the U.S. adopt reflect our own legal tradition, but work well with others so that we don't end up with these sort of data barriers among countries. Let's move a little bit along here to talk a little bit about what kind of legislation or regulation is necessary. I'm going to guess at this point that we're all in agreement that there's a, there needs to be some sort of regulation. We're all on the same page with that? Yeah? Carol? Uh, oh, well, I mean, I think there should be comprehensive legislation. I think it's interesting you chose the word regulation. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to personally believe that the FTC having some regulatory authority would be helpful in this area. I don't know if the whole panel is. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, well, we'll find, we, we're going to we get would. there. <laughs> we're going to get there. Um, what kind of models do we want to 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 work on as we work towards something comprehensive? Um, we saw what happened in California. Um, we know what the GDPR contains. Do we want to follow a European model? Do we want to sort of 
go in California's direction, but create something that blankets the entire U.S.? I mean, I, I sort of previewed my answer on this. I think that we ought to have a, a law that reflects all of the OECD principles. I think those are essential to providing privacy protections. I think they are provide the essential panoply of rights that individuals should have in use of their data, and they can be applied in a way that allows the flourishing of new technologies. Again, without these types of protections, I think individuals will be really reluctant to have their data used for you know, enhanced uh, technologies powered by, AI, powered by machine learning. Uh, but we can do it in our own way that is consistent with our own legal structure. And then because rights without remedies uh, aren't really valuable, we ought to combine that with FTC enforcement, including, I would say, FTC rulemaking, FTC finding authority, state attorney general enforcement, because from a, from a, uh, taking into account federalism, we need to have that as well. So, so when I talk about a comprehensive law, I think it's one that encompasses all of those with a strong enforcement element, as, as Terrell mentioned. Anyone else? No? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree with, with almost all of that. I mean, I think that we, there are pieces of the GDPR that we absolutely want. I mean, I think access correction are certainly pieces, deletion, they're unequivocally, every consumer should, should have access to. Um, I do believe that we, it, we've had a hard time with purpose specifications. We've had a hard time with data minimization. I think, candidly, they just... They've been, they work better in theory sometimes than they have in, in practice. So I think that we should be fairly concrete. I think we should take some particular categories of sensitive information. I'm thinking specifically of location, biometrics, under 13 children's information, uh, you know, the audiovisual information from, for example, a, a speaker device. And we should put hard limits around them. We should say we can collect that information but we can't make secondary uses of it and make that almost a, a full barrier. I think we need to give the FTC, again, some ability potentially to override that if there are particular uses that are, um, that are more virtuous and beneficial to the consumer. But in general, it's, the assumption should be we don't do it. And I think if we're concrete about that, we've been doing this long enough. We're 25 years into the commercial internet. We can start to set some limits. And if we do that, I think that we're going to get to a place where consumers are going to start to understand what can and can't happen with their data. And that's going to, for example, make them more comfortable having an internet-enabled speaker in their house, because they feel like there are some real legal protections around that. And as I said, CDT wrote all these things down <laughs> in a legislative proposal that you can feel free to look at. It's on the website. Thank you. So, so I often like to look at you know, what has worked in the past in this space legislatively to look for um, ideas for what could work in the future. Uh, so when we're talking about, um, Jason, the, uh, the HEW principles, think back to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, right? So that had, it has um, purpose limitations, it has access, it has, you know, it has some, um, uh, some guides on it. Uh, it. It wouldn't work perfectly here. Think about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. That gave the FTC rulemaking authority, but within some narrow bounds where Congress has made some of the harder decisions here. And I think Congress should make some of the, the harder decisions there and then give the FTC uh, maybe a little more authority to put some, uh, you know, fill in some, some of the details, but not just wide open you know, rulemaking authority, because I think that that can be uh, a challenge for the agency to wield. Uh, perhaps some sort of limited. Um, uh, you know, civil penalty authority. One of the things that I really like about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act is it's trying to give parents control over their children's data, and there's different ways that you can do that. And it doesn't say that the FTC is the only one who can specify how to do that. It actually allows different organizations to come up with ways, and then the FTC can look at them and say, yes, that complies with these general principles, and so if uh, companies or, you know, you, it can be companies or trade associations or consumer groups, whoever comes up with those principles, can say, well, we're going to follow that, and then we know we're doing, you know, uh, doing this in a way that the FTC says is, is sufficient. So I think we want to think uh, creatively because if we do want something overarching, there's a lot of different technologies, there's a lot of different types of data. I don't think that there's necessarily like a one size fits all that where you could say, 
you know, uh, it's clear in this context or not, or this kind of data or not, or this technology or not. So I'd, I'd like something that's maybe a little more high level principles, um, and then maybe the details could be filled in um, through even some self-regulation helping out. Did you have something, Elizabeth? Yes, I, I, I wanted to respond to, to Chris, I think. Um, I think we absolutely agree that uh, federal privacy standards should be risk-based and really geared to protecting consumers. I think at the same time, though, it needs to be flexible. And I think you know, it would be potentially problematic to um, enshrine in law now practices that are completely off the table, even if consumers could have the appropriate level of transparency and choose to engage in those activities. Um, so, you know, I I think you know we're we're looking for something that takes into account context and the relationship between the entity that's collecting the data and the consumer. Um, but ultimately, I think I think particularly consistent with U.S. culture and values ultimately letting an individual make choices about their information and how it gets used is, is most consistent with developing a truly American approach to privacy legislation. And I guess I would argue that a consumer can most consistently express their consent by using services that rely on that type of data. So like I can manifest consent to have a package delivered to my house. I understand that you need that data. What I don't understand is that my home address should be sold to a data broker and used for some other purpose or put me on a mailing list. I know that's a very old fashioned example, but we can all think of a lot of them. I do think that there's an absolute place and role, central role for the consumer in this discussion to use whatever products and services they want. I just think that we need to think hard about the secondary uses after that. And I think that's where, again, I agree with you, not absolute barriers, but it's much more substantial guardrails, especially when it's more sensitive uses. Let's turn a little bit to enforcement, and we've alluded to it or touched on it a little bit, but we know that the state AGs have been pretty active on privacy and data protection recently in lieu of federal law. Um, who do we think, and I, I imagine I can, I can guess who Maureen and Terrell might, might say, but who do we think should enforce um, whatever type of legislation or regulation is passed? Should AGs pay, play a role in this at all? Um, I think AGs should play a role, much like they play a role in COPPA, where there's a federal standard, and they enforce to that standard. So you get the ability, you know, the FTC can't be, you know, in all places at, at all times. And so I think you have the benefit of a federal standard, a uniform standard, but the, also the benefit of allowing states to be you know, the people who are kind of on the ground and seeing it. But I did want to make one other point, which is about when you compare this question about should there be a uniform federal standard or should that we have different state level standards, compare it to the GDPR. In Europe, a big thing that they are doing, and the GDPR is part of this, is trying to have a uniform single market, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, you know, these standards and everything are trying to push towards a single, a single market. And that's one of the benefits we've really enjoyed in the US, is the fact that we've had a unified uh, market. And I would be concerned about kind of going in the other direction in the US and starting to create more, more of a patchwork, because I think that has allowed us to be a very dynamic uh, economy. Do you want to take a couple moments? Do people have questions that they'd like to ask? Right in the middle like that. Yeah. <laughs> everything well, sometimes you like to break it up, mix it up. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, Gavin Logan, National Urban League. Um, first of all, thank you all for the panel. I, I rather enjoyed the conversation. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, for those of you who don't know, the National Urban League is one of the oldest civil rights organizations in the United States. Um, we first started in 1910 and have been going strong to provide direct services million people across the country, and uh, this issue has become becoming a, a focus of ours. Um, I will say I did read your, uh, your proposed legislation. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks for the plug. I hope. On the basis of my, my question, one of the things that I read, I caught in that um, draft was the discussion of civil rights issues. Uh, a lot of this conversation has been very consumer-centric 
which I certainly get because that is often our first interaction with internet data issues, data concerns. But my question becomes, to the extent that these issues go beyond the consumer context, so for example, some of the more uh, scary thoughts of what can be done with our data is after that transaction may have taken place. So when, on the secondary uses, if you will. So how do you envision civil rights, and this is for the entire country, but is civil rights import in addition to the consumer protection being uh, accounted for in a data protection? I, I'm happy to jump in on this. Please. I think this is an incredibly important point. And, and it raises one of the things that I think is also really important about the broader privacy conversation that we're having in the legislative debate, which is that privacy is incredibly valuable and it's important to consumers and it's important for our digital lives and it's important to regain trust in technology, but it's just one aspect of the kinds of protections people need in a digital world. Um, the FTC, my former agency, actually wrote a report uh, a few years ago called Big Data, um, tool for inclusion or exclusion in which it raises the fact that there are a number of other very important legal frameworks that we ought to be thinking about in the context of data processing that, that really are sort of outside of purely privacy, right, which is a choice of who gets what about me and when and how much control over I have, I have over that decision. Um, and, and there, that report really tried to focus on the fact that there are a number of very important, I think of them as analog world values and legal frameworks that, that are relevant for outcomes in the digital world as well and processing of data and ought to be considered. I, I, I'd, ag I'd agree with that. I think when we think about privacy legislation and you know, when we endorsed it, we, we wrote a blog and we talked about sort of the principles we thought should independent. it. We thought about why, we talked about why it was important to enterprise cloud space, which is what, uh, which is what Workday does. Uh, but we also put in there that privacy is a fundamental right, and we shouldn't lose sight of it when we are doing this legislation. You know, we're looking at harms, and we're looking at balancing the needs for for data with 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 protections so that people aren't blindsided. That that all this at the bottom comes down to the fact that that there's something fundamentally human about the data that we generate that are about us, and we shouldn't lose sight of that as we go through this process. Yeah, I mean, we were really, I was really excited to, when I, I've heard, obviously, the Urban League's involvement in these issues, and I've, I've watched it. I've also seen a lot of other civil rights groups be more and more engaged on technology and data issues, and I think that that audience is crucial. I, I've, you know, we've, we've obviously had a lot of conversations. Um, we, our, our legislative language focused a lot on targeted advertising, and we, and we worry about the impact of to different types of targeted advertising based on either race or proxies for race. Uh, and we think that's a real concern if you just think about credit advertising, for example. But we also are not, we're, you know, no, I don't, actually I shouldn't speak for the show. I am not an expert on every civil rights law and I would not pretend to, to be one. But we know it's crucial to have experts as part of that discussion. And I think that really in a lot of ways at the beginning, and I hope that there will be to bring this back to legislation, there'll be uh, committees who are maybe not the House Commerce or the Senate Commerce Committees who are going to hold hearings on some of those key civil rights issues so that we can more fully you know, develop the record on that, consider what other legislative remedies we should be considering, because it's a crucial issue. Um, so I, I agree uh, with, with Terrell. I think the FTC's report on big data, a tool for inclusion or exclusion, was a very useful reminder that all of these laws, the anti-discrimination laws and fair credit and equal opportunity, you know, all of that still applies in, in the digital world. So I think that that's very important. But I did want to take a little issue with, with some of the things yeah. that Chris said, which is saying, well, you, you collect the data for only one purpose and you can't use it for another and you can't necessarily use it for targeted advertising because there are good market expanding, choice expanding, examples where maybe you want to use this data as a way to serve underserved populations who say, you know, I, you know, there's a certain type of, um, you know, thing that I would enjoy that, that I would find useful. Think of the growth of BET, right? Mm -hmm. That's been a phenomenal success. 
uh, because it was targeting people who said, you know, the, the, the values and the, the kinds of things I would like to see are not necessarily being, uh, you know, uh, represented very well right now. So I, I'm always a little nervous right. about saying, well, you can never use it for, because there, be, there can be bad purposes and that should, you know, shouldn't be permitted and we don't want sucker lists and we don't want, you yes. know, discrimination in lending, but it can also be a tool to give uh, groups who feel like they're not getting you know, an adequate type of choice in the marketplace to reach those, to reach those people. And it, uh, thank you very much. I actually should clarify. I, I actually put the targeted advertising and, and discrimination issues in a separate category. I think those deserve FTC rulemaking to engage on exactly those kind of issues and try to differentiate different types of targeting. I put them in a slightly different, ca not a slightly, I put them in a different category than sense other types of sensitive uses where I think we can actually say we can limit the secondary uses. I agree, targeted marketing is different in that regard, and, and we do, it does need to be treated differently. We've been agreeing a lot on this panel, some disagreement, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna try and throw a wrench in things. I don't know if this will work. What do we think about including a private right of action in a federal bill? Oh yeah, that'll, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, anyone wanna start? Why are you looking at me now? <laughs> yeah, I just looking uh, down. Look, I, I think they were looking at me. Are they looking at you? <laughs> <laughs> you want to jump in a little? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> or, yeah, well, look, I mean, um, so as a former progressive commissioner, you can imagine that I'm generally for uh, good comprehensive privacy legislation, but also making sure that um, people have adequate protection at the state level. Um, and that they have ways of enforcing those rights. Um, you know, I, I think that we are at a point, at a very exciting point in the discussion around privacy in the United States, where we have a number of different models on the table now that are a part of this conversation. Um, we have some that have been represented already uh, by the various members of this panel today, which I think is really cool. I count three different versions. Nice work, or maybe Maureen, your own. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a number of bills pending on the Hill. We have the California law. We have the GDPR. We have, we have major markets around the world looking to the GDPR as a possible framework. So I think there's no shortage of different models to look at in this space. Um, and I think we'd be well served in, in drawing on those models and the experience from them and trying to come to the right conclusion about what the right solution and approach is here in the U.S. So... <laughs> I'll say that, I mean, at CDT, we support a private right of action. Um, and we think that on, the, on balance, it does a lot to protect consumers. Um, and it's kept a lot of you know, actors very honest in the marketplace. We also, as Jason, I think, led the panel with, really want comprehensive legislation, and we want it to pass. And so when we drafted this legislation, we wanted a private right of action. But we got a lot of feedback from a lot of companies, a lot of academics, and a lot of advocates. And we ultimately came to the conclusion that if we put a private right of action into this bill, it was not going to pass Congress. There was not going to be a private right of action in a bill that passed Congress. And that doesn't mean that that's the right answer. But I view there being a variety of incredibly important and necessary legislative changes on the table. And I think if we make the private right of action the only thing that we, that you know, is the litmus test for this, we're not going to end up with privacy legislation. Um, you know, that's a position that, that is different than many advocates. And I respect that position. And in fact, I, I wish I lived in a world where it wasn't true. But I also believe very strongly that we need privacy legislation. We need to confront these issues. We need to confront them across the United States, not piecemeal. And that comprehensive federal legislation is the best way to do that. Elizabeth? Yeah, I'll, I'll weigh in on this. I think, I think we probably all agree that a really critical component of federal privacy legislation is that it have meaningful enforcement. And I think what where we differ, perhaps, is just in, in how you get there. And I think um, for the, the internet companies, there's, there's general agreement that the FTC is the experts on these, this issue and should be the lead regulator in this space. And in terms of you know, what types of remedies should be available, I think what we look at is what's going to raise the level of privacy 
protections that are available to consumers. And um, you know, I think I think strong enforcement by a qualified regulator is what's going to ultimately benefit consumers the most. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see a, a private right of action being that tool that actually increases consumer privacy. I thought I was going to get someone to walk off the stage on that one. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, failing as a moderator. Um, we only have, uh, yes, we have a few minutes left. Let's go to that question in the back, the way back. Yep, you. So I'll jump in on that. I think there should be a uniform national standard. I think that would be the best outcome for our economy and for consumers. As I said, pointing to what GDPR was trying to do and what Europe is trying to do, they are working on making sure they have a unified market. I don't want to see our market start to fracture in something as important as this. Now, the debate will be what should those standards be. Right, uh, but I think there are a lot of benefits to have a, a single uniform federal standard. Yeah, th this is Tara. I'll, I'll just jump in on that. I mean, I, I think the, the challenge is, is the same challenge that, that Chris has outlined as well, which is that we're at a moment in this conversation where we have a real chance at moving the ball forward in comprehensive privacy legislation for the United States, putting forward an American point of view on these issues that would be very valuable and I think very useful. Uh, the challenge is going to be, is that going to be strong enough so that there is a compromise that can be reached on issues like preemption so that people who have very strong protections at the state level aren't being asked to give up something in, in lieu of federal legislation? Yeah. And I think that's a real debate, and I think we're, going, we're in the process of starting it. I think it's a really important conversation to have, and, um, and it, it should be something that um, is taken very, very seriously in trying to figure out if there's a compromise that's possible. How confident are we that this is going to happen? Like, you know, <laughs> we saw, I do think, you know, CCPA scared people enough that it was like, well, I better put something out there, you know, that I can live with before states start regulating in this very sectoral way. I'm going to interrupt you there and point out that our blog came out in advance of CCPA. <laughs> we have been supporting privacy legislation, not just because of the California law, but because we think it's important for the growth of, of, of technology. Sure. And I th there are a lot of companies who have long been in support of this and uh, advocates, et cetera. So I misspoke. Um, <laughs> but I was talking to someone the other day and they said, you know, if it doesn't happen in 2019, it's definitely not going to happen during a presidential election year. So how confident are we that this is our year? Or maybe, maybe you don't think that 2020 is an impossibility. Well, look, I don't think anybody in Washington right now should be making predictions about much of anything with confidence. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, a number of us have been around this set of policy issues for a very long time. And I will say I've never seen as many zones of bipartisan agreement as are currently on the table. I think that's incredibly promising. So in terms of momentum and uh, winds pointing in a favorable direction, I think that, that it's very promising. Um, that said, we live in a sort of politically challenging moment, and um, navigating those waters is proving uh, difficult for many people. Um, and, and so I think, you know, at best, it's probably a 50-50 proposition. I'm not sure that it matters 2019 versus 2020, to be honest. I think um, the 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 exploration that we're sort of embarked on now um, in the congressional level is going to yield some really interesting results, and we'll have to see where that takes us. Yeah. I, I would say, interestingly, when you look at a presidential year, you look at 2020, one of the, the kind of arguments you can make is, well, everybody's going to be focused on the presidential election. But on the other hand, everybody in Congress and a third of the Senate have a re-election, and they want to show achievements to their constituents. And if you view privacy as a nonpartisan issue, people have different viewpoints that are informed by their by their political viewpoints. But fundamentally, it's like patent reform in a way that it, there's not sort of this strong cleavage. It's an area where parties can come together and sh and do something that gives them a record to run on. So I, uh, I, I share uh, Terrell's view that it's, it's probably a 50-50 proposition, but I, I also share her view that I'm not sure that 2019 versus 2020 is sort of the right way to look at it. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to say, I, 
I also think that we need to grapple with the reality the states are not going back. All right, you are only going to see more legislation at the state level. It's not, it's not getting repealed. And so if you don't, if we do not want, and most of the people on this panel, myself included, I think feel this way, we don't want a balkanized regulatory structure where you're asked to do different things in different states. And by the way, this isn't just like five big tech companies. Everybody's a data collector now. You're talking about hundreds and thousands of companies across the United States who could potentially be looking at a series of different rules. That's a really big deal. Um, and I think we don't want to end up in a balkanized environment. And if that's the case, I think everybody's got to sort of take a deep breath and say, OK, this is real now. We really do want legislation. We're not just saying it. We really do want it. Here's what we want. Here's the regulatory, here's the lobbying muscle we're going to put behind it. And then I, then I think we have a shot. I mean, you could always make money betting against Congress doing something. I think we all know that. <laughs> but I think that we have a shot, and it would really behoove all, of, all the people in this room who care about privacy in a lot of different ways to see if we can make it happen. Yeah. So to, to quote Yogi Berra, it's uh, hard to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> um, but uh, I agree with my fellow panelists that there's a lot uh, more energy behind a uniform privacy law than I've seen in my many, many years of working in this space. And it's coming from different places. So we mentioned Congress. Uh, we mentioned the states. Uh, we're also seeing uh, you know, the Federal Trade Commission, the commissioners, testified that they would support a, you know, a federal privacy bill. Um, the commission had long supported a data breach, uh, a uniform data breach, uh, and data security and breach notification, but now a, even a broader bill. Uh, the NTIA process, right, where they put out like, you know, ideas for what, what should something like this look at. We're seeing it from a lot of different places, you know, industry, where maybe you know, all of them coming together could actually move the ball forward uh, in a way that we haven't seen in the past. Elizabeth? I would just add to what Maureen has said and say that I think one of the things that's really creating a lot of the impetus to move forward at the federal level is, is that level of engagement across many different parts of the government. But also, you know, with CCPA and GDPR, what we've, it, you know, we've talked a lot about digital privacy on this panel, but those laws don't apply just to the online world. And they apply to the offline world. So we're seeing industries that maybe before haven't been as engaged really coming to the table. And I, I think that's great. And I, from IA's perspective, we really do think an economy-wide online, offline, and cross-sector approach is going to be the one that really builds for consumers, you know, a set of consistent expectations in terms of how their information gets handled, and that that's ultimately going to be kind of what helps get to that next level in terms of the privacy protections that, that they that are actually afforded to them. We maybe have time for one question. We're, we're butting right up against it. Yes, sir. Could whoever takes that just repeat the question? Sure. Uh, I'll, uh, so if I understood the question correctly, uh, it was in the cybersecurity space, there's this principle of, of least access. Essentially, you give the minimum amount of access you need for, you know, in order to protect the security of the system. And couldn't you turn that around and apply the same thing in the privacy setting? And, and my answer is going to be yes and no. So the yes part is, look, if you go back to the OECD principles, uh, which we advocate, there are a couple of things that go along those lines. There's a purpose uh, specification. You've got to specify the purpose for which you're processing the data. I can't collect your data for one purpose and then without sort of consent or notice or something, use it for a completely different purpose. Uh, the second thing is data minimization. I should be collecting the least amount of data that I need for the purpose for which I'm using the data. And so 
uh, it's important to implement those. I think where I say where I would say yes and no is we have to implement them in a way that doesn't that's not overly prescriptive that hamstrings folks. So like if you think about this, we have data collected today, we may be able to drive new insights from it. Like, you know, we're really excited about, you know, the power of AI, its ability to make predictions, not for automation so much as but to give humans more information to make better decisions. And you want to make sure people are data is protected when it's used for AI. As I've said, I don't think people will let their data be used for it without adequate protections. But at the same time, uh, you want to make sure that some of that data is available. You don't want to choke off that supply in a way that makes it impossible to do technological advances. So you know, again, fully committed to the purpose limitation principle, fully committed to the data uh, minimization principle, uh, but we should be thoughtful as we do federal legislation about how we implement those in a way that is consistent with our innovative culture. I absolutely agree with that. And I would also add that one of the things that we need to be cognizant of as we talk about data minimization and limitations for purpose and those sorts of things is that data also helps with security. Um, so whether it's per, you know looking for patterns that reveal fraud or intrusions into systems, you know, there are a lot of positive uses for data and we need to make sure we're allowing for those in a federal, federal privacy standard as well. Great, we're a little bit over and I'm not gonna keep you from the coffee refill any longer, so join me in thanking <laughs> our panelists, if you would.